Welcome to the Bioptimizer's awesome health podcast. And now here's your host, Wade T. Lightheart. What is awesome health? It's actually an acronym that stands for air, water, exercise, sunshine, optimizers, mental beliefs and attitudes, and education. These are the pillars of peak health, and my team and I have created a free 12-week course that you can use to transform. Each day, you'll get a written and video lesson delivered to your inbox. Everything is covered from the foundations of digestion to advanced alternative therapies few people know about. And again, it's 100% free. Just go to bioptimizers.com. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S. Dot com. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Wade T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. And today we have Dr. Terry Walls joining us. And this is a really exciting and important audio recording, video recording, if you're watching it on YouTube, because Dr. Terry Walls has a very unique story. First of all, she is in the Institute of Functional Medicine Certified Practitioner and a Clinical Professor of Medicine at the University of Iowa, where she conducts clinical trials. In 2018, she was awarded the Institute for Functional Medicine's Linus Pauling Award for her contributions in research, clinical care, and patient advocacy. She is also a patient with secondary progressive multiple cirrhosis which confined her to a tilt recline wheelchair for four years. Dr. Walls restored her health using a diet and lifestyle program she designed specifically for her brain and now pedals her bike to work every each day. She is the author of The Walls Protocol, a radical new way to treat all chronic autoimmune conditions using paleo principles and the cookbook, the Walls Protocol Cooking for Life. Learn more about her MS clinical trials at HTTPS, you know that, colon slash slash walls, W-H-L-S dot lab dot U-I-O-W-A dot E-D-U forward slash dot. We will have the links to this. I just had a chance, Dr. Terry, to look at that trial and it's extraordinary. You have an extraordinary story. I mean, I, you know, I had um, some a, a relative that suffered from multiple sclerosis, and it is a very progressive and kind of depressing condition of it. And and and, 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 and so many people suffer from suffer from it. I was actually remember when I was in elementary school, we did fundraising for multiple sclerosis research. I, and I remember I raised a bunch of funds and I got this little green little puppy dog as a prize for my for my work as a kid. And I was very proud of that because that was the first time I was introduced to the importance of research around degenerative conditions. And you have kind of spearheaded not only your own recovery, but also some extraordinary research in this area. Can you talk about your journey that led you to this? Oh, point? sure. So... You know, it's 20 years ago. I'm out walking with my wife, uh, and my left leg uh, grows weak, and uh, dragging it to hobble home. Uh, the next day, I see the neurologist who says, "You know, Terry, this could be bad or really, really bad." So the next two weeks, while I'm think- going through the workup, I think about bad and really, really bad, uh, and I don't want to be disabled. So actually, I'm uh, praying for a fatal diagnosis. Three weeks later, I hear multiple sclerosis. I see the best people take the nose drugs. Three years later, I hear tilt recline wheelchair. Uh, I take mitoxantral infusions, then Tizabri infusions, nothing helps. I am too weak to set up at my desk. My zingers uh, due to trigeminal neuralgia, electrical jolts of pain uh, are more frequent, more severe, more difficult to turn off. Fortunately, I'm a physician, so I go to the basic science, I begin reading uh, and uh, experimenting based on what I'm reading. I developed the theory that mitochondria are a big driver, particularly in, in the more progressive decline. 
Uh, and so at first I work on uh, supplements. The speed of my decline slows. Then I discover studies in electrical stimulation of muscles. I convince my physical therapist to let me try that. My test session hurts like hell. Uh, but when it's over, I feel great. Uh, and so my therapist uh, lets me add e-stim to my workouts. I discover the Institute for Functional Medicine. I take their course on neuroprotection. I have more supplements that I'm taking. Uh, and then I have a really big aha. And sort of in retrospect, Wade, I'm like, dear God, how did it take me so long to uh, think about this? Uh, I'm like, what if I redesigned my paleo diet that I'd been following for the last five years based on all the science I've been reading, the, the nutrients that I've said are important, I'm taking as supplements. What if I figure out where they are in the food supply? So I redesigned my paleo diet and it's stunning. Uh, three months later, my zingers of 27 years are gone. My fatigue is gone. And my physical therapist says, Terry, you're getting stronger. Uh, and he begins advancing my exercise. And uh, uh, three months after that, I am walking without a cane. Three months after that, I uh, get on my bike. Uh, for the first time in six years, and with my son, Zach, jogging alongside on the left, my daughter, Zeb, on the right, and my uh, wife behind, I, I bike around the block. For the first time, you know, everyone's crying. My kids are crying. My wife's crying. I'm crying. And if you could see my face, you'd see that I'm crying now. Because uh, that was the moment where I understood that the current understanding of multiple sclerosis was incomplete and who knew how much recovery might be possible. And, you know, it was about five months after that, that I completed an 18.5 mile bike ride with my family. And once again, we're all crying. You know, my kids are crying, my wife's crying, I'm crying. Uh, and this really transforms how I think about disease and health, it will transform the way I practice uh, medicine and it transforms the focus of my research. Uh, and uh, we've done five clinical trials. Uh, uh, we, uh, hopefully we'll be talking about the most recent one. Uh, we've got a, a, a couple more trials that will be uh, getting launched here momentarily. Uh, and I, I've gone from being this, um, sort of unusual, eccentric person that was roundly condemned by uh, many in the MS community to being now a respected uh, dietary intervention research uh, uh, in the MS community and really changing the whole discussion that diet and lifestyle are uh, and should be an essential part of the care plan for ambi uh, every uh, MS patient. This is um, profound. First off, your story is incredible and I can see why that would be activating so emotional because you know, there's two, two parts to it. One, you're not just someone with a diagnosis, you're someone with a medical background. So you understand the progressive degeneration and what that's going to look like over a period of time based yeah. on prior research, you're aware of all the medications, the interactions, the contraindication, all that sort of stuff. And then you go off and kind of do some your own experiments and start reversing what is generally believed to be an unreversible condition. Is that not correct? Well, you know, I, I, absolutely. And I, I want to be clear at the time that I was doing all of this, all of my physicians, my primary care docs, all of the various neurologists I've seen were very clear, MS is a progressive disease. The, the whole point, the reason I was willing, to, and I was thrilled to take these incredibly toxic compounds that I knew had a, a rate of causing um, leukemia 2% each time you took it, because I, I was, and I was already seriously disabled. I didn't want to become even more disabled. So I, I was happy to take very toxic drugs that made me very ill uh, in an effort to slow my decline. 
because this is all about slowing the decline. And as I improve, so my, my face pain is gone, first time in 27 years. My fatigue is gone, first time in seven years. Uh, I'm walking again uh, around the hospital and then you know, around the block. But, you know, I, I don't know what it means. And, and part of what you, you do when you have a progressive neurologic disorder is you learn to let go of the future. Right. And take each day as it unfolds. And, and that's a, a very healthy uh, coping strategy. So here I am, I've let go of the future. I don't know what it means. I'm clearly at a different place than I was a month ago or you know, six months earlier, but I don't know what it means. I don't know, you know I didn't know what it means until the day I rode my bike. Mm -hmm. And that's when I understood in my heart and my bones that the current understanding of MS was wrong and that I was recovering. And who knew how much recovery might be possible? Uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll tell you another sort of uh, funny story. Uh, and this happened the month previous. I hadn't seen my uh, neurologist, uh, you know, because I saw him every six months. And I called the office to say, you know, uh, there's been a big change. I should really see uh, uh, the physician. So they were happy to see me that day. So, well, no, no, uh, I want to come on Friday. So, no, no, if there's a big change, we should not wait till Friday. I said, no, Friday, it'll be fine. So, you know, I go in, I'm, I've walked in. So I'm not in my tilt recline wheelchair, I'm sitting in the office. Uh, in the waiting area and my uh, the nurse comes out and she's got a chart she's looking around and I realize oh I bet she's looking for me and I'm not in the wheelchair so I stand up and go hey hey Cindy over here and she goes and I walk over she's like oh my god you're walking uh, uh, and so you know I, I see my physician he's like oh my god you're walking uh, he, he's thrilled, he, you know, I'm showing what I, my e-stim unit, what I'm doing. Uh, he, he's thrilled, he's like, oh my God, we gotta get your MRI and see what's going on. Uh, and we're both quite surprised. There's no change in the MRI. Uh, and he comes back and says, you know, of course there's no change in the MRI. These are old lesions. They haven't been active in a long time. They're still not active. Um, but what you clearly have done is you have rewired your brain. You are remyelinating, and, and the MRI can't capture that. But your body clearly has uh, rewired and refunctioned your brain and your spinal cord. Can you explain to um, our listeners just what multiple sclerosis is, so that they sure. understand what it what it what it is, what and, and then this breakthrough that you've experienced, yeah. why that's so profound. So uh, it's a autoimmune process where your immune cells are attacking uh, your spinal cord and your brain. Uh, first, we said it was just the insulation, the myelin part. Now we realize, in fact, that they're, they're killing all sorts of parts of your brain. Uh, astrocytes are being damaged. Uh, uh, glial cells are being damaged. Neurons are being damaged. Axons are being damaged. Uh, there are these cute inflammation episodes, those are called relapses that gradually improve. In addition, in the background, there's a slow, steady deterioration, uh, uh, brain volume, spinal cord shrinkage uh, that, is lit, that is associated with that uh, cognitive decline, uh, worsening disability uh, that from which people do not recover. So, and I clearly had a lot of fatigue, um, had uh, was being to have some cognitive decline, uh, and you know had had severe severe disability. I, I could not sit up in a regular chair like I am right now at that point. Uh, and so, what what my neurologist said, you know, very clearly is, I had rewired uh, um, uh, uh, and my brain and my spinal cord. Uh, we didn't really have the technology that could have measured uh, myelin production. Uh, uh, and, and so 
Uh, and unfortunately, we had not sent me over to the neuro ophthalmologist uh, to get something called flicker fusion. If we had, they probably, if we had done that previously and now, uh, they probably would have been able to measure the remyelination there in my optic nerves. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we didn't have it uh, because there was no reason to think, you know, it's going to be any remyelination uh, occurring. Right. And, and that's an important distinction, I think, for people to recognize is now that you've you've demonstrated that it's possible, well, we can start design, de de developing and designing trials about how to, in, to, to measure this, to see which might work, well, right? Is and that, so? that, that And that's what we're doing. So uh, the next trial that we're doing, um, well, should we maybe talk about the trial that we just published and then we'll talk about the next one. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's, let's, we're getting ahead of ourselves here because it's so exciting. Yeah. Um, I just read through this trial. Now, basically, if you want to kind of outline what you've been able to put forth here in this in this discovery. Um, so the, the sequence of doing research uh, goes typically like this. An interesting case study, then an interesting case series about a intervention that maybe changes, uh, it leads to an unexpected outcome. We then did what's called a single arm safety and feasibility study. So, uh, it, and uh, it was my chair of medicine that got me to do this. We wrote up a protocol that outlined uh, what I did for myself. Uh, and then we enrolled uh, 20 folks with secondary and primary progressive MS. So you don't expect any of them to get any better. And in fact, if all you can do is hold them flat as a group, that would be an amazing home run. And if anybody improved, that would be stunning. So we enrolled them. We showed that uh, people could implement it. Uh, if the big, the big side effect, Wade, was if you were overweight or obese, you lost weight, got back to a healthy weight. And I had to uh, file reports every three months uh, about uh, the weight loss that was occurring. Uh, fatigue reduced, quality of life improved. And in half of our folks, motor function, walking function improved. So 50% so of the people started to see improvements in motor function. In, in now, motor function, that, and that's really quite remarkable. Uh, cognition improved, uh, uh, depression declined, anxiety declined. Now, where was in that trial, were you just measuring dietary changes or were you adding the stimulation well, you did so inside? We, the program was to do, could they do everything that I did? So uh, there was diet, uh, there was meditation, there was exercise, electrical stimulation, and supplements. Very complicated and severely criticized, I might add. Of severely course. criticized because, well, if it works, who knows what the mechanism is? And I'm like, who cares? Who cares? First, you got to show, can they do it? And do you hurt them? And uh, does it work? Then you could do follow-up studies to figure out the mechanisms. Yes. So, so we got that first study. Then we got some, again, it was a small, small study uh, funded by my friends in uh, Canada. The next study, again, a uh, small pilot study, now randomized. Uh, and this, we simplified, so it's just the diet. Uh, and we did relapse and remitting folks. We looked at fatigue, quality of life, and motor function. So again, people could do it safe and uh, less fatigue, higher quality of life, uh, better motor function. Wow. Then we did a comparison of um, the paleo diet, the ketogenic diet to usual diet. And again, showing that people could do it. It was safe, well tolerated. <clears throat> the next study, which is a study that uh, uh, you read, uh, I looked at the low saturated fat diet, which is a swank diet. Uh, and that was the only other diet that was out there for uh, um, uh, people with MS and the modified paleo diet. We had a 12 week observation phase where we looked at uh, people's, uh, all of the measures over that baseline period, that run in period to see if they were stable or not. Uh, and they were. Then we randomized them to either the low saturated fat diet uh, or the modified paleo diet. Uh, they came back at 12 weeks, repeated all the measures, 
and came back again in 12 weeks, repeated all the measures. So we had 12 and 24 weeks worth of intervention. What we're able to show is both diets were associated with a significant reduction in fatigue uh, and uh, improvement in quality of life. Um, Walls being, uh, and they're really pretty equivalent at 12 weeks. At 24 weeks, uh, walls had uh, greater fatigue reduction in some measures <clears throat> and higher uh, quality of life than swank in some measures. Now that's the, that's reduced, the, that's the reduced fat the saturated fat right. walls of the walls. It, and why is, do you, why is that, do you understand why that mechanism is? Well, so uh, let's uh, first think about what do the two diets have that's similar and what is different? Beautiful, I love that approach. Okay, so uh, what's similar? Um, we had increased fruits and vegetables uh, in both. Uh, walls had more fruits and vegetables than Swank, but we also increased fruits and vegetables compared to uh, baseline. Uh, and there was less sugar, less uh, hydrogenated fats. Uh, uh, so less of those harmful fats uh, in, in both diets. Uh, now, what is different? Uh, it actually, you know, both Walls and Swank had, uh, uh, so the Swank group had on average about 10 grams of saturated fat. Uh, uh, the walls had uh, on average 16 grams of saturated fat. Mm -hmm. So both diets are relatively low in saturated fat, swank being a little more so uh, than the walls. Uh, the walls group had more fiber, had more fermented foods, uh, had a little more structure in the vegetables, uh, more green, green leafy vegetables, more sulfur rich vegetables, more deeply uh, colored vegetables. Uh, and probably a, a greater variety of fruits and vegetables and a greater variety uh, of meats. What are the mechanisms? Well, we, we're working on a grant that will get submitted tomorrow that's going to look at uh, changes in the microbiome or between the run-in phase, that is the observation phase, and the diet intervention phase. Uh, so we can see how that changes both for the Swank diet and the Walls diet. Uh, we'll look at some biomarkers uh, in terms of the essential fatty acid metabolism uh, and uh, neurofilaments, a uh, marker of, of uh, brain uh, cell damage, uh, and osteopontin, a uh, marker of metabolism and of inflammation, and actually uh, also of um, uh, bone metabolism as well. Uh, and we'll correlate changes with uh, dietary changes and changes with clinical uh, outcomes as well. Uh, so we'll begin to tease out what's the mechanism of diet. You know, it, it, uh, diet is, is a huge driver in uh, changes in the microbiome. So, so my interpretation is um, we have our genetic vulnerability, we have our existing microbiome, and the two of them interact to create more inflammation and a higher risk of autoimmunity and accelerated aging. Mm -hmm. You change your diet, you fertilize and starve out different populations of the microbiome. Uh, and so uh, Astro and I are hypothesizing, we starve out disease promoting microbes, fertilize health promoting microbes, who then as they eat up the food that we eat, create, um, these anti-inflammation compounds that get into our bloodstream and have a favorable impact on our physiology. You know, it's interesting that you've discovered that because we've been in um, digestive health research. We have a partnership with Birch University in Croatia and we develop uh, a variety of probiotic agents in order to elicit the same effects. And we do all kinds of interesting tests. We add vitamins to them. We give them different types of food. We blast them with EMF waves sometimes. And we do, we do all kinds of things to do this research to see. And we've come to the same conclusion that if you can feed the good guys and starve the bad guys, we see positive progressive changes um, that enhance well-being, or enhance health or vit vitality, immune system response, these type of things. And it's really exciting that 
you've done this in a disease state because we're obviously we're in mm -hmm. health promotion. Um, we've got a recent book called From Sick to Superhuman. And our goal is to promote the individuals, the therapies, the research yeah. that it takes people who might have a diagnosis that says, here's what it's going to be. It's the end of the line for you. It's going to be progressive, degenerative. You're going to take these toxic chemicals and drugs and whatever. And then you're going to kind of waste away to say, hey, no, you know what? There are other options that you can take and, and, and experience a, a higher quality of life at best or at worst, and maybe even recover from your condition or, or delay its, uh, its uh, you know, its destructive nature. You know, in my clinical practice, uh, in our clinical research, we, we talk a lot about uh, maintaining your locus of control uh, and reflect on, are you doing all that you can to have the best life today and in the future? Uh, and so uh, we, I just think that is so important to remind people that, that you always have choices uh, and that... Uh, you know, uh, what I'm eating uh, is a big choice. Uh, and so I, I can eat um, food that is delicious and health promoting, or I can eat food that is delicious and disease promoting. It's very simple. Um, I want to talk about something that I think is really important um, before we get into s some more topics. And you mentioned meditation and you, you mentioned kind of letting go of the future. In other words, just dealing with things as they come up, which is yeah. a very kind of mindful Buddhist almost practice of being in the moment and seeing the moment unfold into that and not getting ahead of yourself or behind yourself. What role do you think that played in maybe how you approach this, discoveries that you made, management of kind mm -hmm. of, you know, negative thinking or, you know, the, that sort of stuff. like, how important was that, do you think, to your recovery or your, your, your discoveries? You know, when I was diagnosed, um, my children were quite small, uh, five and eight. Uh, and at the time that I was diagnosed, I was still athletic, still skiing, biking and hiking with them. But very quickly, I could not do that. Uh, you know, I was having to reimagine uh, parenting. And I was having to reimagine my life uh, each year as more functions were being taken away. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, was that like? what was that like just from an emotional and psychological level? Well, um, it was certainly incredibly challenging. Uh, I've all of my life I struggled with depression. And uh, as a young person, I had made the astute observation that for me, if I was athletic, my mood was much, much better. Uh, and so that uh, drove me to get into uh, biking, uh, hiking, uh, running, uh, uh, martial arts. And then as I was losing that, it's like, you know, that was uh, very, very tough. Uh, and uh, thinking about uh, um, I was certainly very depressed uh, looking at, okay, how bad uh, could this be? Was I going to be wheelchair bound? Um, was I going to have uh, cognitive issues? And then, yeah, you know, within three years, you know, shit, I was wheelchair bound. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the average, it's 15 years. So I was um, extremely uh, difficult. Um, but I also fortunately um, was impressed by uh, Viktor Frankl's book that mm. uh, between every event in your life and your response to it, there's a space and in that space, you can make a choice. And it's the choice that defines your character. Um, and so my choice was, okay, you have two young kids who are watching what you're doing. And uh, my choice to give up uh, and succumb to uh, my depression and the dark thoughts that I had would be modeling when life is tough, you, you give up. Mm -hmm. Or I could make the choice of I'm going to do all that I can 
uh, in, which was I want to keep working out, whatever my limited workout is going to be. Every day I'll keep going to work, uh, and they're going to have to have chores. Uh, and you know, uh, I grew up on a farm. I, I, I understood that chores were really uh, very beneficial for uh, children and young people growing up. And so my wife and I had said, you know, our, our kids will have to have chores. And of course, as I became more disabled, like, yep, they have chores and they have uh, a, um, a, a re it was real work that needed to happen. Uh, and so, and I sort of would chuckle like, okay, I guess God heard me when I said my kids need to have chores and mm -hmm. saw to it that they were going to have chores. Victor Frankl uh, has impacted so many people in uh, the book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. I think it's really extraordinary. Quite profound. I wanna extend one other piece to this because to your partner, and I'm sure you had plenty of candid discussions inside of that. What was like that for you and what was your best um, observation of what that was um, like for her? Well, I remember uh, uh, she worked really hard at getting me to continue uh go out and do things uh so she uh, loves uh mountain biking and uh took me in my wheelchair out to the park set set me up uh under the tree while she went uh mountain biking so uh, a much bigger uh, deal for her uh and then uh came back and helped me uh walk down uh to the water's edge uh, and uh, I, I got in the water a bit. Um, uh, you know, a wonderful commitment, uh, just another example of all that she had done for me. Mm. Uh, and then when she was out mountain biking in the winter, uh, uh, um, she broke her ankle and would have to have, uh, and so uh, after, and our two kids were going off to Sweden uh, uh, for a week to be with friends. So we sent, sent them off. We assured them that, you know, Jack and I would be fine. Jack had her surgery to have her ankle uh, set and the pins set. Uh, and I'm taking care of Jack, uh, getting her her pain pills. Uh, and our friends were bringing over uh, a takeout for us so, so we could eat. And the week that we had planned to have off uh, with each other um, while the kids were in Sweden, of course, was quite different. When I was giving her pain pills, we were watching uh, 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 Netflix uh, movies. And I just felt immensely grateful that I could finally be taking care of her. Aww. You know, one of the things that I've noticed, I'm, I went through a tragedy at an early age. My sister was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease and progressively until she died at the age of 22. She was four years my senior. And the striking um, component of being subjected to a serious medical condition and all of its dire consequences and everything that kind of disrupts the natural flow of life, there is this other side of it where you see the outpouring of love and connection and humanity and kind of the noble aspects that inspire all of us to you know it's it, i call it the sublime or to see that there are other energies or forces beyond our intellect that have that define what it is to be a human mm -hmm. and there's these beautiful little moments, whether that's in the patient rooms or maybe with a nurse or a doctor or a loved one or a friend where they go on above and beyond in the care of either the extended family or with the individual. And it's, it, if you've been in that situation, it's, it's hard to describe, it's, it's transcendent because you, you just see pure kindness and pure love and concern for other people and it's it's inspired me in my own life to continue to advocate you know um and commit to helping other people live a healthier and better life because i saw the impact that well your health isn't a guarantee and your life isn't a guarantee at a very early age how has this situation with yourself 
inspired you, your research, and what you yeah. would like to see happen as a, as a way of, and, you know, providing hope and opportunity for more of those moments for other people. You know, when um, I had my uh, remarkable recovery, my chair of medicine at the university called me in and told me first to get a case report written up. Uh, and I'm like on myself said, yeah, yeah, this is your job, uh, your assignment for the year. So I, I got that done. Uh, then when I got that published, he called me back and said, okay, now I want you to do a safety and feasibility study testing out uh, this protocol uh, in others. Uh, and I said, well, that's not the research that I do. He goes, I'll get you the mentors. It's your assignment and that's what you'll do. So I saluted, said, okay, sir. Uh, and uh, then as people at, at the university, some folks were intensely critical of what, what I was doing. Uh, and as I published my research and published my book and my TED talk, I got all sorts of hate mail, immense criticism. Uh, and so I, I'd, I'd do these interviews and I'd say, well, you know, obviously, Obviously, I want you to do what you think is ethically right, but I, I'll tell you that I remember what it's like to be disabled uh, and that I need to tell people what my story was and the research that I'm doing. And they can decide how comfortable they are with eating more vegetables, meditating, exercising, asking for physical therapy, uh, and work with your medical team. And I'll keep putting that information out there. Uh, and so many times I was, you know, ripped to shreds, uh, called unprofessional uh, uh, and dangerous and worse. And I would just calmly say, you know, absolutely do what you think is ethically right. And I am obligated to do what I think is ethically right. Absolutely, I will disclose my conflicts of interest. I will disclose uh, where the research is at. Uh, and caution people to work with their treating physicians. And they can decide how dangerous vegetables are, how dangerous meditation is, and how dangerous exercise is for them. I just calmly state those things. And, and, and you know, people would have their intense reaction, like, um, you know, and I remember one neurologist just saying like, well, and how would you feel if I came and started saying I could do all these things to treat rheumatoid arthritis? And I'd say, well, if that got my rheumatoid arthritis patients to eat more vegetables to meditate and exercise, I would say hallelujah. I want to ask just a thing about because we're living in um, an interesting time right now. And there is a significant condemnation of certain narratives around medical. And I'm, I've been following... Um, the Weinsteins, I don't know if you know who they are, they're evolutionary biologists that were essentially kicked out of Evergreen University and ended up starting their own podcast because they were willing to challenge some of the negative criticism that was directed towards the research. And um, Heather and, and Brett, the husband and wife team, they go through the science currently with the pandemic that we're dealing with today and they take it apart like reasonable, rational scientists with skepticism and scientific method. And I, as, as a non-scientist person, or I don't have a medical background, I find it very refreshing to be able to kind of borrow on their intellectual acumen, their structured thinking to go through this. And they also have received extreme levels of criticism. And I've interviewed a number of doctors who have made breakthrough discoveries. We've had them on the podcast and in variety of conditions. And, and they too get subjected particularly to very vicious attacks from their peers. Why is that, do you think? Is, well, is there something threatening about it or is, does so it- So I'm gonna explain the yeah. biology of why that happens. I'm gonna invite you to reflect uh, pretty carefully. Uh, we'll talk about this. Uh, sensory input as it comes up, uh, uh, to my spinal cord and brain is an overwhelming volume of information. Mm -hmm. So at various uh, points, the amount of information that gets through keeps getting cut down to smaller and smaller amounts uh, so that my vision, my hearing, my sensory, my sense of space 
is a tiny fraction, less than half a percent of what's coming in. Uh, and that, uh, and as infants, we learn to do that so we can uh, uh, cope, we can feed ourselves, interact with the world on, on just a tiny amount of information. And we learn to do that in our social uh, constructs, uh, first in our family unit, in our expanded uh, uh, universe of friends, uh, uh, colleagues in our educational life, and then in our work life. Uh, and so we, we learn to interact with a tiny amount of information uh, for my relationship with my, my spouse, my kids, uh, my uh, family. Uh, and so as information that comes in that doesn't conform to my understanding of the world, it doesn't get to my cortex. It doesn't get to my higher understanding. It, it's been pruned out. And then when it finally does get to my cortex, I ignore it because it doesn't, it doesn't match my understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I may ridicule it. I may push back again. And then occasionally there's enough information that I realize maybe I need to change my understanding of the world. And we will do that with my understanding of my best friend, my spouse, my kids, my work environments, my professional environments, until my understanding of the world uh, is somehow shattered. So of course, our, anyone who is an innovator, who thinks of something really new and different is gonna face that kind of resistance. The innovators in order to be successful have to be okay with being ridiculed, rejected, uh, and potentially burned at the stake. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, part of the reason that I think I've been successful uh, and wanting to hang in here with this is that I have this internal moral obligation because of my own experience. The other reason that I'm successful is uh, I'm a lesbian. And so I had to, as part of my evolution uh, as a, an emotional uh, adult is uh, to let go of societal expectations of me. Uh, and I finally uh, let all of that roll off my back and became comfortable with who I am in my family structure. And being able to eventually get comfortable with that, I think has made it easy for me to let the criticism that I've gotten. And probably another thing that is helpful is I, I'm sort of clueless. My, my family uh, found, has found it far more stressful for, for the amount of criticism that I've gotten over the years. You know, my work, uh, my family, what I'm doing, and I'm oblivious to the world. Uh, uh, and so I, I've, I've learned to pay more attention to the world uh, professionally, but I'm still more oblivious uh, than many of my colleagues. It's a very important distinction, I think, for people to understand that much of our world, I, th I think it was um, um, Ramana Maharishi that says, um, there's no sense of being upset of the world because the world you perceive doesn't actually exist. <laughs> <laughs> and funny enough that you brought this up is on Sunday I was at my meditation uh, center and the monk was giving a discussion about the amount of information that's coming into our nervous system and how much of it is actually filtered out and the component of meditation is to increase and open up one's awareness to increase the opportunity for us to expand our consciousness or our awareness into other areas. Yet we live in a world today, which is fascinating because we've never had more information coming through to us, yet specialization has increased as society um, in, improves in technological innovation. So for example, a hundred years ago, I needed to know how to chop wood and I needed to know how to uh, farm and I needed to know how to maybe uh, properly hunt or clean animals and how to fix my house. And it was a very more rural setting. And today you can have a job in, in an in a urban area, let's say as a cashier, and you literally don't have to know anything other than how to punch numbers into the code and mm -hmm. what's on. And so the, the interesting component as we've developed so much technologically we, in, in, and we get so much more information, there's almost like 
as a response, there's a drilling down to narrowness. Do you think that is something that needs to be identified in the medical community? Or do you think there's a way that we can cultivate innovation and geniuses in a way that doesn't draw the ire of people who are performing functions within that field? And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, supercharge your protein shake. Everyone knows protein shakes are a great way to sneak in extra protein, build more muscle, even replace meals and burn more fat. The problem is the highest quality protein typically absorbs at around 40%. One way to fix this and dramatically increase how quickly and effective your protein shake digests is to add two to three capsules of masszymes into your shake. One research study showed that pre-digested protein during a meal increased muscle growth significantly. To take advantage of this, just blend the open capsules into your shake and within 15 minutes or less, the enzymes will have begun to break down the protein into amino acids. This can make your shakes at least two to three times more potent. Some people do this and sip on their shake while lifting to provide their muscles with a steady stream of amino acids during their workout. To save 10% on masszymes, use the code SHAKE10, that's S H A K E. One zero at masszymes.com. That's shake10 at masszymes.com. I think um, anyone who's truly innovative is going to draw the ire mm. because it's very uncomfortable to have to uh, abandon my constructs of how I understand uh, the world. Uh, uh, none of us want to do that. I don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. We won't easily do that. Uh, and so I, I don't think it's possible to have innovation without uh, facing ridicule and rejection at first. And then either your ideas pan out uh, or they're suppressed. Um, uh, And so uh, you keep doing the experiments. Uh, I I have um, a a unique story. You know, it actually, the universities uh, sort of commented on this uh, because most of my research has been funded by philanthropic gifts uh, from people whose lives I have touched, who then uh, afterwards, who happen to have money and say, you know, I believe in what you're doing. I'd sort of like to support your research. Um, uh, and uh, so here's a gift for your next uh, project. And so the second time that happened, but we got a, a six figure donation to my research lab the uh, dean of the college called me in. I had a meeting. I thought, dear God, you know, who have I pissed off now? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and it was like, this has never happened at the University of Iowa. So what are you doing? Uh, and, you know, we continue to have uh, some remarkable philanthropic support uh, which is a lot, that has allowed me to invest it to do some really interesting and small projects. And now we'll be doing this much larger project uh, because I've made a different, I have a protocol that has had some dramatic impact uh, on people who have resources then to come back to me in my lab and say, you know what, Uh, we like what you're doing. Uh, talk to us about some ideas, uh, and uh, we think we'd like to give you uh, another larger gift. Uh, and so that allows me in some ways to be vastly more innovative than uh, folks who have to write grants that have to convince their peers of a newly innovative idea uh, who can't accept new big innovations. They can only accept small incremental uh, uh, partial innovations. You know, and, was- and, and what I've done uh, with my multimodal studies was a huge, big uh, innovation that uh, was completely, uh, utterly rejected by all of the NIH folks in uh, 2010 when we were writing those grants. Uh, but now, you know, in 2011, uh, these multimodal studies are being uh, done uh, and our work is being cited. Beautiful. I was also listening to Eric Weinstein. Um, That's Brett's brother. He runs a podcast called Dark Horse. He's an 
advanced physicist and a super genius. And he was sharing how many of the current um, research grant organizations are stifling a lot of the development of science and what he felt that there was um, between him and his brother and his sister, they had three um, hum human transformational discoveries that was essentially being suppressed. And he says, well, if you do the math of how many other researchers that could be situated in this, I think a lot of people, um, and, and this is what I love about alternative funding, that the NIH over the last 30 years, I think, has given out somewhere around $3 trillion uh, in research grants, but they, def they define what gets what gets accepted and what doesn't, but now there's these other funding options that you kind of illustrated with yourself that are allowing researchers to maybe go outside of the normal parameters using science, but to kind of create exponential growth. Do you see that as the future for, for research that you're doing or, or expanding or well, other researchers in the field? So so I, th I think the peer review uh, uh, incremental approach uh, has certainly hugely deepened understanding of physiology in, in very uh, wonderful ways. Uh, um, the ability to do what I'm doing has also uh, altered understanding in really profound ways. Uh, and that has been on the basis of this philanthropic gifts because we've made an impact uh, on the lives of people who happen to have a, a lot of money. Uh, and you know, when I'm in these meetings with my other scientific colleagues who are doing dietary research and they're uh, right, you know, and I'm writing grants along with them and so are they, and, and we're uh, talking about the huge struggles to get through uh, to peer reviews, to do uh, the innovative work. Uh, and when I reflect on what I'm gonna be able to launch into next, uh, because I've had, I, I'm so blessed to have this philanthropic support. Uh, and I think the bigger breakthroughs will come through from uh, folks who have access to philanthropic support. Now, can you talk about what's coming down the pipe for yeah. what you're going to uh, what you're going to so be it's very exciting. next? Um, so uh, again, this is from uh, a grateful patient uh, who really believes in what we're doing. We're going to enroll people uh, with uh, multiple sclerosis relapse remitting who want to do a, a dietary approach. Uh, they'll need to be uh, agreed to be randomized between a ketogenic diet, a modified paleo diet, and dietary guidelines. Uh, we'll give them uh, support uh, uh, over that uh, time period. We will follow them over two years. We will be measuring, uh, did they actually implement the diet? What, what are they eating? So we'll, we'll know uh, about dietary adherence. We will know about clinical outcomes uh, in terms of walking function, vision function, hand function. We'll understand patient reported outcomes in terms of uh, mood, uh, um, uh, uh, processing speed or memory, fatigue, quality of life. We will have uh, uh, biomarkers as well. Uh, uh, and this will be the first time that we'll have had a study of this size for two years that we'll be able to uh, look at uh, changes in clinical outcomes, uh, changes in biomarkers. We'll also be looking at uh, myelination uh, along the way uh, as well. Uh, uh, and we're, we'll be freezing uh, microbiome specimens, we'll be freezing uh, blood specimens. So at the end, uh, we will also be able to write another grant to go back and say, uh, let's look at the molecular mechanisms of what is going on and why. Uh, so uh, you know, this will be absolutely transformational. Uh, a, a smaller study that may be even more transformational in some ways, some ways. Uh, is, uh, is going to be looking at an, an online course uh, that we've created uh, that teaches people through uh, virtual technology such as this, um, how to uh, improve diet, uh, uh, stress reduction, exercise, uh, uh, and these 
supplemental non-diet, non-exercise things that you can be doing. And we'll see that impact on uh, MS patients. Uh, we've, uh, we're, uh, so that study is approved. Um, we are uh, talking now with our cancer center uh, and we anticipate having it, it studied in cancer. We're also talking to rheumatology folks and studying this in rheumatologic patients as well. So if, if we can show and anticipate that we'll, we will be able to show that we can teach these concepts online and have an improvement in dietary intake, uh, improvement in uh, patient reported outcomes. Now this is the sky's the limit. There, uh, we, we can uh, transform more lives. Uh, this can be uh, uh, expanded. Uh, we, it's, uh, it uh, has no limits. You know, this is one of the beauty, um, beautiful things about the internet and the, the distribution of information is once a, uh, a demonstrable protocol breakthrough can be developed, you can share that with a wide variety of people who might not have both the medical or, yeah. you know, the, or the, even the knowledge of that by, you know, Hey, they find out about it. They can experiment. They take it to their professional medical science and say, Hey, I'd like to, I'd like to experiment with this on our own, on my own. Is that what you anticipate happening? Well, what, what we certainly anticipate is that this makes it so much more available to uh, rural communities, to small, smaller communities that don't have access to, uh, professionals that could, uh, uh, say, a dietitian, or to those populations for whom transport into a clinic is uh, a huge difficulty because of their motor disabilities or access to transportation. Uh, so I, I think this uh, makes it so much more readily available, and it standardizes uh, the education. So, I mean, I think this will be uh, you know, huge, huge, huge uh, technology. You know, it, the, the uh, next, the other studies that we're, the grant, next grant that I'm writing, and we'll see if I can get this funded by grant, and I, or if not, we'll be going back through philanthropic support. Uh, uh, when can people stop a disease-modifying drug treatment? When, when can you do that? When is it appropriate? Uh, so there are a couple of studies that are underway now that are randomizing you stop or you stay on, there's no intervention to make it more likely that the stoppers will do okay. Mm. So of course, you know, you know me, um, I'm like, well, there's a lot we can do to make it more likely that if you stop, you're gonna be okay. Uh, and so we're working on designing uh, studies that could make it more likely that the stoppers will in fact be okay. That's a, that's a really huge piece because I guess once a, once a, person has a diagnosis and is gone by standard care and is on a, a, a pathway through their physician, many of the physicians are remiss to kind of stop that because of the, you know, the, the legal and well, so that would, would that not be so? The current standard of care for an autoimmune disease is once you're on a disease modifying treatment, uh, you're on that the rest of your life, mm -hmm. or maybe until you're in your 60s. Uh, should, is there a way to identify who could be weaned off safely? Uh, and so I think that's a, a really important question. Uh, I've been talking with my neurology colleagues who agree like, yep, that's a really important question. Mm -hmm. We've been working on that study design uh, and uh, we will be putting that grant forward. Uh, very excited about that. So I'm gonna, I'm going to invite you <laughs> now that you kind of, you've said that you had to give away the future, but I'm going to ask you, what do you see happening in the future? So I'm going to ask you to go out there. What would you like to see happen or what would you like to see um, come out of your research, your work and, and that of your colleagues in this area? What, what do you, what do you hope to happen? Well, you know, I think um, uh, what I see is more dietary, multimodal interventions, uh, that there is a greater recognition that human f physiology is incredibly complicated, that single drug-based uh, steps, uh, compounds that uh, uh, impact our physiology in one pathway very effectively is not going to restore health. 
But if we're going to restore health, we're going to have to work on a comprehensive multimodal support. And that it will make it even more complicated and messy is that if I'm going to do a multimodal intervention that addresses diet, lifestyle, exercise, I need to allow for self-determination because if I'm going to have you uh, adopt this multimodal stuff for the next year or two years, I need to design a, a method of support that gives you autonomy to select elements of mm -hmm. what is the meditative practice you're going to do? What is the exercise you're going to do? What is uh, of the dietary plan of the menu of what I opt, uh, offer that you can do? So that we're designing a lifestyle intervention that meets my uh, targets, but you've had autonomy and design it what, to meet your needs and your family needs. That's messy, complicated, hard science to do that we're going to have to work out. But uh, I, I think it's really arbitrary for you to say you got to do ballet as your workout. You're going to have to do uh, the modified paleo diet as your workout, and you're going to have to do a mantra-based meditation as your meditation. Um, that doesn't allow for autonomy. That's going to make it much harder to uh, adopt this new behavior and sustain it. If we can personalize this for that you have a variety of acceptable um, strategies that you could use to hit the targets that we lay out, uh, I think that would be more successful. Um, my team and I are uh, thinking deeply about how we could design that. Uh, uh, what are the parameters that could work? Uh, and what are the standardized targets so it's re reproducible science? Uh, this will be messy, it'll be difficult. Um, and uh, I think one of the reasons I'm so innovative is I don't have a PhD, I have an MD. I have a uh, depth of clinical experience. I have ideas that I hire my PhD to say, okay, we're gonna take these ideas, we're gonna keep working on it till we come up with a rigorous approach that's reproducible, that honors the basic framework that I've laid out. Uh, yeah, and my PhDs are coming along, they're like, okay, okay. I, yep, I, we think we can do this. It, you know, I realized now that if I'd had my PhD, I, I wouldn't be as innovative. Uh, I would be more in this, yeah, the, the, the intervention has to be exactly this intervention and we're not going to allow for any uh, patient autonomy and right. self-determination uh, yeah. because that is how research is done. Correct. That is not how life is lived. Right. PhD research is you're controlling all the parameters in life. It's impossible to control all the parameters essentially. <laughs> So um, if we're going to ask, ask someone to do this for a year or two years, we, we need to uh, think about um, that self-determination aspect a little bit more. Last question before you, we go. You've been so generous with your time and your information, your research. And I know there's going to be some listeners here that are going to wonder about this. I would like for you to speak to someone who might have multiple sclerosis or someone who might know someone with multiple sclerosis oh, sure. and are looking at options, what would you say to them as someone who has, you know, been subjected to the, to the diagnosis, saw the degeneration and found a way to turn it around and have doing research? What would you say to that person? Um, so I had really profound disability and profound levels of pain and was able to have a dramatic impact uh, by addressing what was under my control uh, and then working closely with my physician to adjust my medications appropriately. We've seen that in others. And of course, we don't know for you what level of recovery might be possible, um, but are you doing all that you can in terms of improving your diet, adding a stress reduction practice, uh, thinking about movement practice? Um, we, we have a variety of uh, tools that can help you in that journey. We'd love to be support. Uh, it, it's not just MS, it's part of the prodrome, it's other autoimmune conditions. 
there's so much that can be done to slow your decline uh, and often uh, rest and reverse uh, the disability. Uh, would love to help you. And, and we could, um, we have a variety of resources uh, for you at terrywalls.com, T E R R Y, Walls, W A H L S.com. Dr. Terry Walls, it's an honor and a privilege for you to join us today on the Awesome Health Podcast. And I am inspired by your story and your research and your work. And I'm wishing you uh, continued success in this journey. I know you're making a big impact for a lot of people, and that's a very noble cause. Thank you for your effort. Oh, much love to you and your team as well. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. Just absolutely remarkable work about what's possible. As you know, we believe that you can go from sick to superhuman. Dr. Terry Walls is someone who has is a living example of the possibilities of great diet, meditation, and an iron will to discover the possibilities of human physiology. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate uh, you listening. If you like it, you can share it. And of course, check all of the information on the show notes if you or someone you love is suffering from one of these autoimmune conditions like multiple sclerosis, make sure that you check out Dr. Terry Walls and her research. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm A.T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers. See you next time. At Bioptimizers, our mission is to fix digestion. And a cornerstone of digestion is gut flora. P3OM is our patented probiotic formula. In fact, we call it the Navy SEALs of probiotics. You see, strong proteolytic or protein digesting activity is paramount to having a healthy gut flora. And of course, P3OM provides that. The good news is, unlike weaker probiotics, P3OM survives the digestion process. What it does is it basically multiplies the good guys while protecting you against pathogens or what some people call the bad guys. P3OM really helps to rebuild your digestion. And what that allows you to do is to maximize nutrient uptake, energy, and metabolism. To find out more of how P3OM can help you, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.